The fruit came from all over China. Apples from Xinjiang, pears from Hebei, tangerines from Shijiang and Fujian. Every so often there might be dragon fruit from Hainan Island in the far south or clumps of baby bananas on the stem. They came by 13 metre long truck, all the bounty of the land spreading its seeds to the back door of the wholesale fruit shop which Xiao Xiao's parents ran in the far north where no fruit grew. Winter took the skin off your fingers here, north of the wall. The blanket of hard land above Beijing, previously known as Manchuria but simply called the Northeast in Chinese, is the head of the rooster which is supposed to be China's map. From its crest you can see the aurora borealis and the midnight sun. Temperatures get down to minus 40 and snowfall comes up to your waist. There are still a few lonely Siberian tigers who stray over from Russia without proper visas. Heilongjiang province is named for the Black Dragon River, which snakes along its border with Russia. Four hours by train from the provincial capital, tucked between Inner Mongolia to the west and Siberia to the north, is Nehe. Rows of identical apartment blocks are still under construction, as if the city had bloomed spontaneously from the tundra-like earth. But for a frozen river that you can drive a truck over in winter, it could be any other small Chinese city of just half a million people. Here, on the 4th of September 1985, Liu Chao was born. She was delivered by a midwife at home on her parents' bed. For the first hour she didn't cry and everyone was beside themselves. Then she began bawling to the gods and they tearfully wished she would shut up. At the age of seven days, her ears were pierced with a needle and red thread, an old tradition to bring good luck and health. Seven days was also how long it took for her mother and father to name her, leafing through a fat dictionary to find a character they liked. In the end, they settled on Xiao, which means sky or clouds, and is part of an idiom about a loud sound resounding through the heavens, like her first ear-splitting cries. In another tone, the word means small or young, and from an early age, her pet name was Xiao Xiao, Little Xiao. Xiao Xiao was a girl, and if she married her own child, wouldn't continue the family name of Liu. The one-child policy, implemented in 1980, not long after Deng Xiaoping ushered in China's reform era, meant that her parents couldn't legally have another but families were still catching up with the idea, especially further out from the urban hubs, and the law was far from monolithic. Xiao Xiao's parents waited another four years until her father left his strictly supervised work unit, then had a second child anyway, a son, and got away without paying the hefty fine. These post-80s only children, bearing all of the hopes and wishes that their parents missed out on in the Mao years, are mollycoddled to comic extremes during infancy. They are helped up after every fall and wrapped in more layers of protection than a porcelain vase in transit. Add the attentions of two sets of grandparents and the pampering snowballs into a smothering excess. In her first winter months, Xiao Xiao was only occasionally visible underneath layers of baby thermals, her cheeks the same shade as her crimson padded jacket. Until the age of seven, she lived with her maternal grandparents in a countryside hamlet two hours' drive out of Nehe. Their courtyard home had pigs, geese, ducks, chickens, a dog, and a single bed, a platform of clumped earth above a coal-fired stove called a kang, on which Grandma, Grandpa, and Xiao Xiao all slept in a bundle of shared warmth. Layers of newspaper were pasted across the walls and ceiling. Headlines about... Deng Xiaoping's southern tour of China in the early 90s found better use as cheap insulation. The only entertainment was traditional folk storytelling on the radio, while Xiao Xiao sat on her grandmother's lap. It's common in China for grandparents to raise a child while mum and dad worked long hours in cramped city conditions sending back money. Tens of millions of the post-80s generation grew up like this. Those in the countryside whose parents are migrant workers far away are called left-behind children. 
whatever the circumstances, to be separated from your parents leaves its mark. Xiao Xiao's mother remembers with pain one time when she visited her daughter after being half a year away in Nehe. She went in for a hug only to see that Xiao Xiao didn't recognise her, but instead hid behind Grandma. Xiao Xiao moved back in with her parents shortly after, into the flat where she was born. Close at hand, on the edge of town, was the family fruit wholesalers. She liked to play in the warehouse, which smelt of apples. Cardboard boxes were stacked high to the ceiling, forming corridors that got narrower with each new delivery. At first, she assumed the trucks that arrived were from nearby, or maybe from her grandparents' village. Then, her father showed her on a map of China where some of the fruit came from, and she never looked at the trucks in the same way again. In her first years of school, as she learnt to read and write the thousands of characters necessary to be literate in Chinese, Xiao Xiao matched up the place names on the fruit boxes to locations on the map. She asked her mother about these exotic locations, and Mum, who had never travelled further than Beijing, would rattle off the requisite stereotypes. Sweet Xinjiang pomegranates? That's where there were dates and desert. Bulbous Henan apples? People are cheats in Henan. Smelly durian fruit from Guangdong? They eat anything that moves down there. Lands far away were all the more appealing because there was nothing to do in Nehe. In the 90s the city was smaller with few cars on the streets and a single set of traffic lights at the central intersection which was called Central Street. A popular drink among teenagers was, and still is, boiled coke to warm their insides poured straight out of the kettle. Those little older favoured strong baiju liquor made from sorghum or rice, earning the reputation northeasterners pride themselves on as formidable drinkers with quick tempers. In a Heilongjiang winter, the only entertainment is boozing and fighting. Xiao Xiao ate sweets instead. There was a shop that sold them next to her primary school. Peanut nougat, white rabbit candy, penny sweets in rustly wrappers with a picture of a stern old man on them. Chow Chow Tang powder that crackled sugary on her tongue. She had three plastic dolls and embroidered clothes for them herself. Sequin tops, beaded hats, wedding dresses, having learnt the skill from her two aunts, both dressmakers. One of the dolls had blonde hair and blue eyes, a cheap knock-off Barbie, which she called Ocean Baby. The three dolls were best friends, of course, and went on holidays together to the deserts of Xinjiang, to Henan, where the people are cheats, and to Guangdong, where people eat anything that moves. The Chinese New Year, also called Spring Festival, was her favourite time. It was a fortnight of feasting and treats that marked the first month of the lunar calendar, beginning with a big family meal on New Year's Eve. Days of eating leftovers followed, while visiting increasingly distant family relations. Along with the other children, she was given decorated red envelopes that contained small denomination lucky money in them. In the city's central park, people lit fireworks and firecrackers on the frozen ice, sliding back just in time before the bang and pop. On the final night of the celebrations, Lantern Festival, she loved to watch the wish lanterns fly up and away. TV played a big role in the holidays too. She watched the Chinese cartoons Little Dragon Club and Black Cat Police Chief as well as the Japanese anime Doraemon, Robot Cat in Chinese, and also Tom and Jerry. Her favourite show was Journey to the West, a live-action serial based on the Ming Dynasty novel about the adventures of a monk a sand demon, a pig spirit and the monkey king as they quested for the secret diamond sutras in India. It had ridiculous costumes and cheesy special effects, flying Taoist masters with white eyebrows as long as beards, animated magical weapons flashing on screen, but it was a huge hit. The show still plays on repeat every year. When Xiao Xiao started middle school, everything changed. Her dolls were taken away, TV was restricted, and the fruit storeroom she played in became off bounds. The shift was so sudden that Xiao Xiao remembers thinking she was being punished for an unknown crime. Overnight, the pampering she was used to transformed into the true legacy of the only child generation. Crippling study pressure. Early childhood is a protected time, but the fairy tale crumbles as soon as you are old enough to hit the books 12 hours a day. 
Knowledge changes destiny, Xiao Xiao's mother used to tell her at dinner, a familiar saying. School days began at 7am. The ritual, in the middle of the morning lessons, shared by children across China, was group eye exercises. For 20 minutes, the class of 30 or more kids rubbed the outside edges of their thumbs over and around their eyes, in unison, up and down the sides of their noses and the skull behind their ears, before pressing their temples. These exercises were supposedly effective in staving off myopia from all the book reading to follow, while Xiao Xiao's teachers lectured her without expecting anything but silent attention in return. Geography, maths, science, history, Chinese, music, art. The topography of the 34 provinces, municipalities, autonomous regions and special administrative zones of China 33, if you don't count Taiwan, Chinese inventions, foreign invasions, ancient history and legend, knowledge changes destiny. In English class, national textbooks use the same cartoon boy and girl, Li Lei and Han Mei Mei, to explain grammar points through clunking dialogue. Along with their foreign friends, Lucy and Lily, a bird called Polly and a monkey called Monkey, they are the reason why, if you ask a Chinese child, how are you, their reply will likely be to the word, I'm fine, thank you, and you. During break, Xiao Xiao sat off to one side from the other kids with her head in the clouds. The day ended at 7pm, when teams of students scrubbed the school clean according to a rota before they could go home. Xiao Xiao liked to gaze out at the dark northern sky through her classroom windows while she scraped the muck off them and fantasised about those faraway places where the tangerines and dragon fruit and bananas came from. <laughs>